I don't know. Ayupat has some country. Ayupat has some country. No, no, uh, physics. Uh, Ayupat is the universe. Physics and applied physics. Uh, P -P -P. Yeah. And like Ayupat. Uh, yes. I was being, actually, yeah, I think I was sort of being more active about physics. Than exactly. <laughs> so. That's because we are minority. Small. I think also because they are more public opinion. Yeah. Start. Okay. So, good morning, everybody. Welcome to today's, uh, today's seminar. Very happy to welcome Anikets Mule from HBCSE TIFA to give the third talk in the IAA Scope seminar series. This seminar series focuses on practices and methodology in the outreach and education, astronomy, and related fields. Anikets, it is BSc in New York College in Mumbai and is MSc in IIT Bombay. He then did his PhD in Astrophysical Institute of Potsdam in Germany in solar uh, magnetohydrodynamics. He then joined Hoyova Center for Science Education, HBCSE, which is a part of the IFR in, uh, in Mumbai uh, in 2006 and is now an associate professor there. Uh, his interests are, I mean, many of you know him, if you're interested in outreach or education, you know him because he's been one of the central figures, driving many initiatives in India for many years. Uh, his interests are astronomy education, mass education, and history of astronomy in India. He's published papers, edited books, and organized many workshops and conferences on these topics. Uh, he's been in charge of the Indian Astronomy Olympiad since 2006. Every year you would have seen articles about Indian teams getting golds and silvers and bronzes, and a lot of it, a lot of that effort, yeah, effort comes from Anikhet Sole and his colleagues at HPCSE. He, he, he was recently the General Secretary of the International Astronomy Club Olympiad Committee and uh, from 2016. And he's going to take over as the president of the International uh, uh, Olympiad on Astronomy and Astrophysics soon. Uh, so he'll be sitting on that side of the table for us. He's also the chair of the National Indian National Astronomy, Indian National Astronomy Education Coordinators NIAC, committee of the IAU's Office of Astronomy Education, which was set up a couple of years ago, I believe. Yeah. And he's a member, he's a member now, and he was the chair of the ASI Public Core Education Committee as well from 2018 to 2022. He was one of the architects of the OAE Center. Uh, the India Center of and the Deputy Manager of this currency. Uh, you may also know him from other uh, as, as one of the people being who has been doing a lot of work very, very strongly against uh, spread of pseudoscience and popular in, in public domain and popular media. He writes a lot on science outreach, science education, as well as uh, science versus pseudoscience in Marathi and English. And so we welcome no, welcome you all to and welcome Anikets to deliver talk to all of us. We have people joining us on YouTube live as well as Zoom. And as usual, at the end of the talk, we'll take questions from all of you. So, Hello. Is it audible? Yeah. Uh, so, thank you for inviting me. Uh, today, I'm going to talk about this new initiative which has been launched earlier this year formally. But I will tell you the story behind it, which has been so the this is, has been in Python for the last three, four years. And I'll initially tell you how this came about. So to understand what OE is, we have to first go to uh, the vision of International Astronomical Union, what it wants to do in the future. So they published this IU strategic plan for 2020 to 2030, which is follow-up of their pre previous strategic plan, which was from 2010 to 2020. So this latest strategic plan, if you want to read in full, uh, you can uh, follow that uh, link and uh, you will be able to say, read that. In that, they have clearly spelled out that it is not sufficient to just do astronomy research. We have to engage with society in various ways. Engage with society as well as engage with uh, upcoming uh, the, sorry, new astronomers or the students, the student community. So from that point of view, they have decided that they would uh, engage with the community with through the four special purpose offices. Uh, which are like one is uh, Astronomy for Development Office, o OAD, and OAD has been uh, around since 2010. It is headquarters in Cape Town. Then there is Office for Astronomy, uh, Young Astronomers, OYA. This is this given the this has been given status of office now, but uh, IU has been organizing these international schools for young astronomers for like 30, 40 years, or maybe more than that. So organization of those schools and engaging with uh, early career astronomers, PhD students and early postdocs 
that has been going on for a lot of time. So that is done through OIA. Uh, then there is Office of Astronomy Outreach, uh, which is based in Tokyo. Uh, NAOA has taken responsibility of that. And the newest one out of the four is Office of Astronomy for Education. And we are part of this. So we will uh, we'll go through the other things quickly and then we, I'll come to OAE. So OIA, I already mentioned that IU has been doing this schools uh, in different countries, especially focused on uh, inviting students and postdocs from the countries where there is not much base of professional astronomers uh, so that they get a chance to meet professional astronomers from other countries and learn from them and so on. So <coughs> they're focused on that group. Uh, Office of Astronomy for Development, the idea was to connect with uh, UN's vision of sustainable development. So United Nations ha has its uh, 18 sustainable development goals and OAD promotes use of astronomy in achieving those goals. So how we can develop some community or some, uh, uh, what you can say, uh, this small, smaller underdeveloped country <laughs> using astronomy as a vehicle. So it can be astrotourism, it can be uh, empowering uh, the teacher community that there uh, by providing some telescopes and things like that. So those kind of projects come under OAD. And uh, OAD has a setup in Cape Town, which is mainly uh, trying to identify good projects and try to find sponsorships for those projects. So OAD has some bu budget uh, on its own, but they also try to find sponsorships from other sources and they direct the sponsors to this good that we know that we have developed this project potential for the, this project. It is good project, but we don't have money to give it to them. Can you please give some money? And that way, OED uh, keeps operating. Then, uh, before I go to the outreach and education, uh, so uh, outreach office and education office, uh, often this, there is this question that what is exactly outreach and what is exactly education? This always uh, because in most cases we say. Uh, you take institute level committees, if you take uh, even ASI committee, it is outreach and education both together. And then people ask which part is outreach, which part is education. So, as per my understanding, I will not say this is a formal definition in, in like that. Outreach, I would classify anything which is a standalone one time interaction with any group. So, you go to a college, give a lecture, or go to a school, give a lecture, or you or write press releases about discoveries. You have institute open days, interviews in media, or you organize contests for students. So all these things, you are communicating astronomy with public, but you there is no sustained engagement with a fixed group. One press release, you are sending it to media. Some ten people will read. Next press release, some other ten people may read. It is possible some of the people may be common, but there's no guarantee for that. So you have to always assume that that one press release or one interview should be standalone its, itself. The person who is listening to this or reading this may not read the next interview. So that is those kind of activities we classify as outreach. On the other hand, if you go to education, so education would be some sustained interaction with some group. And at the end, you should have some tangible learning gains. You should not outreach. There is no clear forced expectation that you, if you send up, if you do one in media interview, everybody who listened to that uh, that interview must have learn uh, learn something. But education, you since you are doing putting some more effort, uh, so this sustained interaction, you it is reasonable to expect that there should be some gain for the people who went through that program. So that can be like through uh, workshops, summer schools, some training program for students or teachers, or uh, maybe weekly clubs, uh, or you can write books or other learning materials, uh, curriculum development, textbook writing, uh, assessment methods, evaluation, or educational research, which can later inform policy. So all these things, all these kind of activities we will put under education. So, given this distinction, 
even the role of o OAO, that is Office of Astronomy Outreach, and o OAE, which is Office of Astronomy for Education, this distinction becomes clear what kind of activities are uh, suitable for OAO and what kind of activities are suitable for OAE. So let's come to OAE. Uh, if you want to know exactly what OAE is doing, I will tell you anywhere to inform more details. There is website astroforedu.org. So astroforedu.org is the website for OAE. Basic idea of OAE is like focus on school level. At PG level, we already have OIA. So not to overlap with that. And there is a lot of work already being done because many universities in Western world have been teaching astronomy in undergraduate programs. So, and then there are dedicated conferences for undergraduate level astronomy, education, thing like that. So OE thought their focus should be purely on pre-university, pre-undergraduate. So from kindergarten to class 12th, that is focus area for of work for OE. Uh, then second thing, it is see OAO said Office of Astronomy Outreach. OAE says Office of Astronomy for Education. That middle word is important. So it is not just teach astronomy, but try to see how we can leverage interest in astronomy to teach other things as well. So that is, is more wider. Then create a global network of astronomy educators. Uh, try to lobby with policymakers to include more astronomy content in school curriculum and create resources for astronomy education. There's a basic idea which was which is there in IU Vision. Uh, and based on this idea, IU invited proposals uh, that this is the on the, along these basic controls, they want somebody to take up this challenge and establish OAE. Uh, so it was a global call asking who would like to invite, uh, take up OAE as a main project. And this global call was given in late 2018 and they received some 23 letters of intent, including one from India. So Indian letter of intent was a joint proposal of IUCA and HBCSE. Uh, we sent it in around March 20th in the first version. Uh, so that time we had meetings with many people. We tried to see if we can do it uh, a pan-India thing or we should be focused on one geographic region and, and like that. So finally, it was uh, the proposal was written by mainly myself, uh, Somak uh, Manojindu was there at IUCA at that time and Divya, he was because NCRA was also partially interested and Divya himself was interested. And so we four uh, worked uh, mainly on this proposal. Uh, and that time we had proposed that we will do this four different work packages kind of thing, uh, arrangement, where one work package will be focused on curriculum and material, one on teacher training, one on astronomy education research, and fourth one on international networking. And under that, we had listed out a few things, uh, like for example, what we mean by curriculum and materials, like analysis of teaching of astronomy as topics, development of course curriculum, uh, and the this research division camp is like having brainstorming meetings or of uh, astronomers, teachers, so that we can create more resources. Then similarly, teacher training programs, how we uh, we can de develop, make it more structured. Like for example, we. Typically, we have been doing, a lot of us have been doing teacher training programs. And by anecdotal evidence or by practice, we know what works with teachers, what doesn't work with teachers. But there is never any documentation of exactly what is what sh should be the characteristics of a good teacher training program. And like, I know from my memory, okay, these things work, these things did not work, so I, next time I will do something better. Similarly, Nidesh knows something. But if third person wants to take it up, some other institute, they would either have to they have to either call us and find find out, or they will have to learn through again by making again the same way same mistakes. So there should be some proper documentation of these things. So that is a thing which we uh, proposed. Similarly for other things, I will not go through this thing. So based on this, uh, our proposal total six proposals were shortlisted. Uh, 
for the second round of uh, detailed proposal, including uh, how much uh, money you can invest on this, how, how many people you will hire and all those things. All those details have to be given to them. So there, there were uh, proposals from India, Italy, uh, Germany, uh, China, China, uh, and then two proposals from USA. Uh, so they were asked to send a detailed device proposal. Uh, and we propose that it will be jointly maintained by IUCA and HBCAC, uh, but it will be based primarily in IUCA. We had uh, proposed that we will have some three, four dedicated people or or OE and some committed budget. In by September, we were told that we have not won the uh, bid to get, get OE, and it was not announced who has won, but somebody else has won. And but we were anyway invited to attend uh, a meeting in December uh, 2019 in Paris. Uh, this the Shaw Foundation has given money to IU to conduct annual workshops on astronomy education. This was the first Shaw IU workshop, and in that meeting it was announced that Heidelberg House of Astronomy has won the bid to host OED, and they signed the MOU in that meeting itself, and. That time, the proposed director of OE, uh, he gave, he told me very clearly, in not the six uh, other five losing uh, uh, bids, but all the 23 countries which had sent letter of intents, all were invited there. And he said that, see, even though we have won the bid, we don't want to do everything ourselves. We would like it to be a distributed network. And that is why we have called all of you here. We would like to know how we can uh, build a network. And so this is the place where OE is hosted, this House of Astronomy in Heidelberg, which is just outside Max Planck uh, in Heidelberg. Uh, if you have not recognized this, the building is designed in the shape of M51. So, and uh, this is the present team. Uh, Marcus is the director. Uh, Carolyn is deputy director, and then they have a uh, lot of other people. Uh, most of them, obviously, uh, are shared with, because House of Astronomy also has uh, they, their own local outreach activities. Uh, I, so most of them have these shared positions, either with Max Planck Astronomy or uh, House of Astronomy itself. Uh, but they do this team. They have been doing fantastic work over the last two years. Uh, we have been interacting with them continuously, and it was a fantastic team. Couple of things must be uh, Kind of, I think, oh, director, deputy director, uh, Gwen, they are full time. Uh, I think these coordinators also, they have like, I think, 75% uh, at OE and 25% something else, or something like that. Full time. So they have, I think, uh, some uh, understanding with uh, Ma uh, Max Planck Consortium and uh, some private organization. I think Carl uh, or some somebody. So some some foundation. So they got some money through that. Not the IAU, but yeah, Max Planck. Max and uh, private bodies. They... So IU would <laughs> give some budget to sponsor the projects, but not for salaries or maintenance. So that is the idea. Uh, so OE objectives as given by the German proposal, uh, create a community which will uh, produce uh, high quality aspen teaching resources, uh, which should be accessible to all. Or the community should share knowledge of base teaching practices, uh, educators should gain skills to evaluate their resources and methods. Methods uh, suitable venues exist to make uh, their own astronomy education tools known within the community, and curricula uh, utilize full potential of astronomy in uh, STEM context. So, for example, if you are teaching uh, about chemical elements, you can again use astronomy context. I show. Nice uh, pictures from uh, of nebulae, and then uh, I show spectra, and then show talk about how 
uh, chemistry is also used in astronomy and those kind of things. And the many such examples you can dig out from various STEM contexts. And for them, the action points are uh, so create a network of astronomy education coordinators, uh, what we call as NIKES. Uh, so create resources and best practice examples of uh, evidence based standards for ticket learning. Uh, transfer of relevant knowledge within the community, uh, evaluation methods, uh, then regional and international schools for astronomy, yearly shop IU prize, uh, shop, uh, shop prize IU workshops, and OE centers and nodes. So that is network uh, of offices which uh, they wanted to build. So the, the functioning plan is OE will create this network of centers and nodes. Some projects will be done through Heidelberg. But many of the projects will be independently run by OE uh, centers and nodes. Uh, and main office will just do coordinating job. So as per that uh, plan, they invited proposals in May 2020 to host OE nodes and centers. So India sent a proposal to host OE center uh, in June 2020. It was accepted by September 2020. But after that, exact negotiations of MOU, MOU wording and then getting uh, that MOU also Approved, approved from the our ministries. It took some time, and finally, it was MOU was signed. Uh, like formation of our center was signed, announced in January 2022, uh, end of January 2022, actually, uh, for I think 31st January or something like that. So presently, under OE network, there are five OE centers. So what is center? Center OE center is something which has a small team of five to seven people out of which one or two maybe full-time dedicated people uh, for uh, OE work and there should be some committed in institutional support. And so centers can start their independent projects or, and plus be part of larger projects. Uh, there are presently five centers, one in uh, Beijing, one in Cyprus, Egypt, uh, India and Italy. Uh, out of this, uh, China, is going to focus mostly on uh, Chinese language speaking regions. They want to create materials in uh, Chinese language. Uh, Italy is going to focus mainly on pre-primary and primary education. That is the uh, uh, area of expertise, the institute where it is going to be based. It is, it is based that institute works on pre-primary and primary education. India, we have, we have proposed that we will focus on evaluation and assessment. And Egypt and Cyprus are pretty new centers, so they're still figuring out exactly what do, should be their focus area. Uh, Cyprus is thinking about uh, focusing on astronomy in the Mediterranean countries. And that, like that. Yeah. I mean, I like come to that. So, how strict do these be these partitions? There, there is no strict partition in the sense. Uh, these are the focused areas in the sense the they say that we say that this is our area of expertise so naturally we would try to work think about projects in that direction but it we are always open to collaborate with other centers to participate in the other projects which other centers have looked at yeah but this is uh, uh, they uh, there's always hope is the centers, centers will keep growing. So in East Asia, there may be uh, more centers in future, uh, future or things like that. And in America, yeah, or Singapore, for example. Okay. So, Sing Singapore, for example, has a good uh, community of, of manuscripting people. So if Singapore comes up with center or note, they may want to collaborate or in like that. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. And then there is something called nodes. What is nodes? Nodes is just one or two people who have interest. They want to commit their some uh, time, but they may not have direct institutional support. So they are not committing any money or they are not going to hire any dedicated personnel for, for OAE. But they, they will say, okay, okay, I can spend some of my own time uh, doing this. And currently there are three nodes, one in France, uh, in Paris, 
one in Nepal and one in Korea. So, uh, apart from these no centers and nodes, there's also NIAC network. Uh, NIAC is National Astronomy Union Coordinator. So, all countries, the IU's aim is that each country should have a team of NIACs. Uh, but up to for about five people is what they have recommended. And keep diversity in mind was the instruction. The objective is lobby with policymakers for inclusion of astronomy in curriculum. Create peer network of astronomy educators within your own country. And network with other NIACs to make uh, global projects. So Indian uh, IU committee was asked uh, to propose names of NIACs uh, and they proposed five names. Uh, so the NIAC committee for India is myself, uh, Sarita uh, from IST, Somak from Ayuka, Kuntal from Eris and Suchitana from Presidency. And in the second show workshop, we actually made an introduction video which you can watch by clicking on this uh, link. And all NIAC teams were also asked to submit a two-page, two to three-page write-up on the education, uh, school level education in your country. Uh, not just, so start with like how many schools, roughly what kind of uh, uh, resources are available in schools, or uh, what kind of uh, educational boards are uh, operate and things like that. And then go on to what is astronomy content in, in the school curriculum. All this within two pages. So uh, that report for India is also available on this link if you want. So for OE Central India, when what we proposed and we, which got accepted, we gave these as our objectives. One first is uh, tools for student teacher assessment, which can mean uh, I will explain most of these things in detail later, but I will just list out things, concept maps, concept uh, inventories, teacher competency surveys, uh, methods uh, for uh, uh, methods of creative forms of assessment. Then second objective, we said resource materials, which can be online as well as offline. Third objective, we said regional capacity building. So teacher training programs, model curriculum, learning standards document. And then we, we can be global partners in many other projects. So one of the presentations which we gave to OE, uh, this was a slide presented that we will take leadership in these kind of projects. We can be part uh, contributors in these kind of uh, things which other centers are taking lead in, and plus regionally we can do these things. Uh, this regionally thing is important because uh, OE also recognizes that what will work as curriculum or resources in one type of country may not work in other type of countries. Realities are different. Like if you go to Western Europe, almost every student has access to a computer when they sit in the class and things like that. Uh, they, everybody has fast internet at home to do projects, but that is not the case when you come to Asia or Africa. So realities will be different. The kind of content which can be taught and the way it can be taught will be different. So there will be a lot of customization and region wise. So that is why curriculum development and teacher training can't be done a global in a global standard model. Uh, these things, since nobody else was doing and HBCC has been working on this area for other sciences in the past. So we thought that this will be a good opportunity for us to do something different, which has not been done anywhere around the world in case of astronomy. And these things many of the people also want to do, like uh, meeting the workshop is very common, but resources for or online resources, the website, uh, videos, and uh, interactive websites, and all those things. So those things are pretty common. So we will, we can be part of the what everybody else is doing. OE reviews uh, is another vision of Heidelberg uh, Group that they would like to create a read it first kind of set of documents for teaching different topics. For, and this can be made available for teachers. It is not exactly as per syllabus, but if you want to teach anything related to astronomy, just read through this. It can include some content, but some also information about pedagogy, uh, how this, this can be taught. So those OE reviews they want to create, and we can be part of that. So 
for OE India, the structure we have, we have proposed is uh, a national steering committee will be uh, responsible for uh, supervising the uh, center, which is yet to be set up. Uh, the center manager or deputy manager will be responsible for day to day operations. Uh, so, what, the waste is going to be based in either by traveling to Pune or Mumbai, which have already started happening. Uh, in, in the initial phase, we propose that we will support it through our regular budgets. We are not asking for a separate budget from government as of now. Uh, so, uh, since Ayuka has been doing teacher training programs and uh, uh, visiting schools, similarly, GCC has been doing teacher training programs and visiting schools and all those things. So, we anyway had budgets for those under those heads. We said that we will use some of that money to support the initial phase. And later, we can, once we have a proof of concept, we can uh, send a separate proposal to government to get a dedicated budget for this. So, presently, uh, Surut from Ayuka is designated as the center manager um, because the, mainly the larger part of OE activities are going to be based at Ayuda. Uh, I'm designated as deputy manager and we have two postdocs uh, working for OE. Uh, Asmita is go, working at HBCSC and Mopia is working at Ayuka. And we have project engineer uh, working again at Ayuka. And plus we hope that there will be many more volunteers from many other institutes uh, and Ayuka Associate Network and various things who will add to this. These are the people who are going to be primarily involved, but they are not the only people. Now coming to what projects we want to do, and I will start des describing these one by one. Uh, first project is the materials. Uh, I'm starting with things which are like low-hanging fruits, and then I will go to some things which are more challenging. Uh, so materials, obviously, it is no-brainer that every somebody says education, something you want to do, create materials. Uh, so it can be booklets, it can be learning units or uh, learning uh, modules, uh, demonstration experiments, which can be shown or as tabletop things in schools, uh, online videos, animations, interactive web uh, websites where uh, people can uh, like play with the website to see how things ha happen uh, or other materials. Uh, for example, uh, this our project, yes. Yeah, so yes, so we have not evaluated that which of these would be better. Like each things have advantage and disadvantage. Uh, for example, uh, we think in the urban India now internet, online-based things are way to go. But in online domain, we are competing with also the resources created uh, by NASA or other sources which have much bigger budget to create fancy animations and things like that. So maybe uh, in online domain, it may be better to create a curated list of resources that these are the trusted resources, these are well-made, there are no mistakes. You can go through that instead of creating our own resources. Uh, offline, if we write a very uh, textbook-like thing, it is likely to go to dustbin. But in HBCC, for example, uh, we are doing a project since last one year where we are say, creating a newsletter, eight-page newsletter on all sciences, not just astronomy, uh, which will go to uh, schools in absolute uh, rural areas where they, they have no access to other any other thing. And that is being very well received. Like, why we know it is very well received, we get feedback from teachers is one thing. But secondly, along with that, uh, we also give, give them some uh, pages to write their own uh, responses or do some activity and uh, send us their observation. And we are getting very good res uh, responses. Of people sending those back. So that is that it shows that it is well received and there is need for those things, those printed materials still. But it has to be designed keeping those realities in mind, cannot be just, uh, yeah. Are you getting this list uh, almost include everything, everyone can think of this So, which also means that you have to be able to have everything. No, I, so, okay, sorry, I, I, should, I, I should say clarify. So, I'm going to list 
10 categories of projects which can be done. Okay. And in principle, OE can start doing this. I am not saying that we will start doing everything, each of this. This is a list, an exhaustive list, which we have at the back of our mind. And we will take up some of these as and when we get, get time to do them. Some things we will prioritize, some things may not happen immediately. Okay. And under and again, these are categories of project. Under each of these, you can have many sub things. Yes. I yes, yes. theater is one thing. Uh, TV Vengada Children has written a fantastic book on what you can do about uh, how you can teach a simple physics of moon seasons and all those things using the kind of uh, role play activities. So you invite students to be part of that role play and uh, so there is a small booklet which is available on internet on Arun Gupta's website also it is there. So those kind of things also will come under that. But there are many things and many of these things as you people have said it's already been done. So part of it is curation, part of it and then identify gaps where resources don't exist, add those resources, can be the way to go about it. Uh, other materials, I will show one example, which uh, this engineer who is working for OE, he has started doing. Uh, so OE Heidelberg uh, started a project called Astronomical Glossary. Their idea was that they will make a list of some, they made a list of some 900 terms, which are commonly used in school level astronomy teaching. And write a concise one paragraph or three, four line explanation about each of these terms. So teachers can find it handy. Uh, so they, are, they have made that list. Now they, they're going through the process of tra starting translations. I think they're creating some kind of uh, interface for the, making this translation process easier. And the translations will start soon. So what our engineer thought that since that English language this was, uh, list is already available, why? We, he thought he can present, present it in a different way. So we started designing cards like this. So you can make this set of cards and distribute to teachers. Each card has one term, some picture about it, and uh, the explanation which we have taken from this I am uh, OE closely, closely. So like this, like this, he is working on that. And he is doing it in his uh, spare time in a sense. Uh, we have assigned him some jobs. After that, whatever time he is left with, he is continuing to uh, develop more and more cards like that. So resources, as as such, we are uh, putting on the back burner to be done in spare time. We want to do something which has not been done before. But if you have time, you can also start doing this. Then teacher training programs, another low hanging fruit. We can start any time. Like we may start sometime in next month, we are planning say, one bird teacher training program and so on. So uh, we have been doing in some form, we can keep doing it, we can keep improving it. Uh, focus, uh, the focus should be on teacher competency. What we see in India is we at sc school level, you have science teachers and you have math teachers. Math teachers are math background teachers, but Science teachers, most of them are from chemistry or biology background. There are very few physics background people who go in school teaching. Uh, I have not done a concrete survey, but anecdotally, when I speak to with teachers in, from different things, my estimate is about 15% of the science teachers are physics background people, 85% are chemistry or biology. And because of that, Usually what we see, even when we uh, interact with teachers and uh, do teacher training programs, we always hear from teachers that science teachers will request their friends, math teachers, to conduct the physics, uh, teach the physics chapters. They don't teach the physics, physics chapters in school at all. Or in many schools, which are where there is no quality control, the, the science teachers simply announce that these chapters are skipped for the exam. And they only teach the chemistry but the chapter get away with that. This is practically happening because these science teachers don't feel in a, a competent, competent, uh, competent enough to teach, 
teach these things because if students ask some question, they don't know answers. They're scared of teaching these topics. <coughs> so, teacher training programs should for, focus on developing teacher competency and teacher confidence so to tackle the astronomy in the curriculum. Then, another uh, easy project to do is translation to Indian languages of resources, good resources which we have. Uh, last year, last two years during pandemic, uh, we had this Indian scientist response to COVID ISRC network. And through that network, we developed a method to quickly do translations in multiple Indian languages of the resources which we created. So we know how it can be done. Now we have to find a team using ASI network to do the repeat the same idea in, in case of astronomy. So now actually for, for ASI, one of the ASI projects, we are trying, trying that out. Uh, as a part of ASI 50 celebrations, we created three graphic novels and uh, one on Jantar Mantra, one on uh, gravitational waves and one on galaxies. Uh, so basically there was a small team uh, which co discovered, collaborated with India uh, IDC and IIT Bombay. See, students did this as a final year project for uh, so one of the those books, Jantar Mantra book, which is particularly come out very, very nicely. Now we are getting it translated in different Indian languages. Uh, translations in about ten languages is ready, and we are trying to rope in people to get more languages done. Uh, so this kind of thing can be done. Again, this is something which is on back burner. We don't want to do it uh, as a or priority thing. Okay, now we come to things which have not been done earlier and we where OE can definitely have an impact. So start with a proper baseline study of state of astronomy education in the country. That is, go to different setups, different schools in different settings, some semi-urban areas, some rural areas, some really tribal areas, very remote schools, display schools for displaced kids, like People who are displaced because of a large dam, things like that, their schools are set up in some, some other place. Go to all kinds of cities and talk, conduct interviews with uh, teachers, students, school authorities to understand a few things. One is current astronomy content effectively reaching the students. Do teachers possess content expertise and pedagogy expertise to teach that content? Do students see existing astronomy content as useful? Are there any student expectations which remain unfulfilled? They're like they would like to know more about, say, even uh, say, let's say that they want to know what is black or they want to know how universe started, but content doesn't talk about that. School estimate content doesn't talk about that. So just list out answers to these questions first. See what, what is being taught and what people want it to be taught and how it should be taught. So that is that will form your baseline to do further work. There is one project which we'll, we are going to start now. Uh, then another project which we have already started is develop a tool to systematically analyze the textbook content. Like, and we, our hope is that this tool, one, once it is ready, we can just release it for wider use. The entire night network or around the world, they can simply take the tool and start uh, using it for their yeah. Five minutes. Oh, I should then I, I should hurry. Sorry. Uh, so then, uh, so the for the design process for this tool is like make a list of concepts, uh, make categories for rating each concept, uh, make categories for rating non-textual material, and then uh, analyze that. So I should, so for example. Uh, under Earth, what are being, what is being taught in the in the curriculum? So, so Earth subgroup things, artificial satellite, definition artificial satellite, and examples of artificial satellites. Or uh, under coordinates, there's Arctic Circle, Antarctic Circle, Eastern Circle, like that. You make a list of whole co concepts which appear in, the, in your content, and then how you analyze that? If it is textual content, try to see if it is just information or Students are asked to recall some observation which they see in daily life, or students are asked to actually conduct some uh, observations in the future to realize uh, the phenomena which, they, which is being explained, or is there a reasoning given behind it why this is happening? 
is the scope for misrepresentation in that whatever is written in the text can it be misinterpreted by students in, are there any estimation of numericals involved I, are there any practice exercises given for that uh, concept if it is visual content is it photograph sketch schematic map or graph how it is linked to the text is it explicitly linked it is if the is the link implicit by placement or it is there is a clear caption are there clear labels inside and so on so that way you keep analyzing the uh, entire content and see what is working properly what is not working properly so that is a pretty up So one of the practical problems which we uh, while talking because what we realize is the schools are during daytime, and when you try to organize some additional activity in the evenings, uh, parents are unwilling to say send young kids, especially girls, back to school. So that is a big barrier which we have, and that barrier we have to find ways to overcome. So they can like you said sketch, they can sketch their observations at home in daytime. So the question is whether the current Curriculum encourages to do that, or whether they simply just tell them, okay, this is happen, this happens, just remember this. So that is the way we have to analyze the content. Then concept, I will quickly go through these things. Concept maps is like you make a tree, a tree of how different concepts are related to each other and through what relations. So here a concept map of concept map. So for example, concept here, concept maps represent organized knowledge. Is content independent? So, after knowledge is concepts, concepts are perceived regularities or in events or in objects and like that. So, you make a tree of that which will tell you how students relate different concepts with each other. You realize what kind of wrong interpretations can crop up if you don't build these connections properly in your explanation. So this has been done extensively in many sciences. Many sciences researchers do this, but it has not been done enough in astronomy. So this is another area which uh, where uh, people we can work in. Then concept inventory is another another thing which is again very common in physics. Others, chemistry, biology are just picking up these things, just starting. But astronomy, hardly anybody has done this around the world, not just India. So concept inventory, for example, this is an example. Like so, there. These are like uh, diagnostic tests, mostly MCQs, to evaluate student understanding of one concept area. Uh, this example from something called forced concept inventory, which was the first such thing. So the sample question, a stone is dropped from the room of single story building to the surface of earth. And students have to choose one of the, one of the responses. So single story building is the key part. It reaches maximum speed quite soon after release and falls at constant speed thereafter. Speeds up, speeds up as it falls because gravitational attraction gets considerably stronger as the stone gets closer to earth. Speeds up because of an almost constant force of gravity acting up upon it. Falls because of the natural tendency to, of all objects to rest on the surface of earth. Falls because of the combined effects of the force of gravity pushing downwards and force of air pushing it downward. So, and then students have to choose best response. And many of these questions are cross correlated within, within one, one questionnaire. So, just by giving one correct response or one wrong response, you don't judge the student. You see overall how the uh, uh, student's uh, conceptual uh, mindset is. And uh, so, as I said, force concept inventory was first one, uh, which was done in 92 by Hestinus. And you can access that by clicking on this link. And there are other many such concepts in physics now. In astronomy, I tried looking for it. There's only one uh, questionnaire which claims to be concept but it is not uh, like really a concept just one set of questionnaires, uh, which you want, you, you can access it here. And it is also for UG students. So this is something which has not been done in, uh, about astronomy. So we, we want to do that, do this. Uh, then learning standards document. When you start developing curriculum, there is always an initial 
uh, document why you want to uh, teach certain topic, what skills you want uh, students to learn, what, uh, what are the interdisciplinary connections about that. That kind of exercise has not been done for astronomy content in Indian context. Uh, if you go to this website, this is a website for learning standards document for US, current learning standards doc documents. Uh, they have done a fantastic job, but something like that has not been done in India. Then, uh, model curriculum, one minute. Uh, model curriculum is uh, under NEP, they have said that you want to have electives uh, in high school at high school level. So it is reasonable to assume that schools would like to propose astronomy electives. We should create a model curriculum for them. It is another project <coughs> is possible. Uh, assessment tools, uh, which we should create ready to use tools for people which can do teacher competency surveys. We can uh, test learning gains for students, uh, test efficacy of teacher training programs. Now, this is, as I said, 10 uh, list of, uh, uh, 10 categories of projects where we see collaboration opportunities with other institutes and other, other groups working on education and outreach is, uh, so we would like to also work in the same decentralized manner like OE is doing. OE said that we don't want to do everything ourselves. We will create network of centers and nodes which can take independent lead. Similarly, we OE said India would also like to do the same thing. We will do coordination of different groups who want to work on education and outreach. But if the groups who want to work independently on some of the projects, we would encourage that. Uh, we can so provide academic support from the OE center. Uh, but the groups can independently uh, with their own resources can take up one of, one of these projects and start uh, working on it. That is where I stop. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks again for the lovely talk. Uh, these are issues we've been talking about for decades. Uh, you know, in the tea time and coffee time, it's good to see that these are coming together in a structured and you know way which can be sustainable. That's really good. Uh, so I request uh, the people on Zoom and YouTube to type in the questions there and take them. But first, let's start with some questions from the audience here. Yeah, the room. Yeah, please finish. So, Can you shout the questions out? Yeah, yeah, sure. So you talked about the sustained approach so that you can have longer term activity with the ID group. But in this, what I see the problem is, see, part is you are targeting the school students. But in that, I don't see any efforts are being made to approach the board itself, like ICRC, CPSC, and CRD, or even the regional boards are India, who will not be willing to take this. Because if you just approach the private schools, they may be happy. But you need to target the committee itself who can harmonize the whole process and the education. So, how, what they so let me repeat the question for the yes. people online. The question from Arvish was that uh, the top. No, looked at teachers and students and all that, but it, it, it did not mention the school boards through which all the implementation happens. So how do you get that in the future? Okay, so uh, I'll tell you the answer from uh, what we are seeing in NBCC. Uh, when it comes to influencing policy, you can't simply go and knock on the door and say that, okay, I, I, I have some good suggestions, please, please take me. If they invite policy suggestions from wider audience, but that time like, they get uh, like thousands of uh, letters. And I don't, uh, I don't think they would be reading each letter patiently and uh, trying trying to get messages from them. So what works in the past, what has worked for NBCSC is you create good resources, good model curriculum, and whoever is sitting in the curriculum committee there, they would know NBCSC has created that. They simply copy from them. That works much better. It, Somebody has done good work, let us take it. Why, why if they want to do, do reinvent a bit? How do they know that they are done? Because HBCC is known, uh, known amongst the uh, textbook writers and things like that. So it is, uh, it is uh, over the years, we have built that kind of rapport with most of the, uh, like, uh, NCRT uh, faculty members, uh, NIPA, uh, Regionalists of Education, all of them know about HBCC. Okay. So maybe, that, maybe Vijayan Patipa is an example. Yeah, so we so HBCC has other projects like Vijayan Pratibha, for example, is a project where we want to develop some uh, learning modules which go slightly beyond syllabus uh, for uh, high school level. And we have been working with 
केंद्रीय विद्यालय जवाहर नवोदय विद्यालय सेंट्रल स्कूल टीचर्स so and some of these teachers will all eventually go in curriculum uh, textbook writing and things like that so they would know about these things and all these resources are available easily on website on the one part second part uh, the national education policy is trying to decentralize this most of it anyway they are giving freedom to schools even the government schools to get, uh, choose uh, offer new courses as electives at high school level so uh, the monopoly of central textbooks will actually go down in in coming years that's the dear follow up yeah i was thinking that whether you have you proposed it putting astronomy education in the science background or in art because in the school if after it converts already to section cover so how do you think so okay the question is that whether uh, this astronomic inclusion should be in science or arts because up to then there is separation that separation is also by the going away as per nep uh so nep says that up to 12 uh, everybody is in the same stream you can choose electives but uh, there is say, same high school so but anyway uh, what we can do in principle is a level, introductory level astronomy course which doesn't require too much uh, for mathematical or physics or uh, things like that at school level and some advanced level astronomy course which includes uh, some calculations and uh, some more conceptual deeper conceptual uh, things uh, so we can have two different things for two different kinds of electives and a follow up on that is correct yeah. the us for example many universities have for many years had courses called uh, physics for humanities majors or astronomy humanities majors so that kind of a concept yes. work in this at school level the so same idea but at school level uh, yeah please other comments questions really had some more even experiences from your own If yeah, nice talk on the book. So I had this question because we interacted with all these students from schools and colleges. So in my experience, I get a lot of emails from college students or even school students saying that uh, they want to do a project and their research interest, which is like black hole and cosmology, has a lot of overlap with what I do. Huh. So, but the thing is that even when you 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 were know, giving the talk, you mentioned that they want they want to know how a black hole forms or how the universe started. So my question is that where from this fascination is coming from? Is it science fiction or how you know two people are communicating with the society? I mean, they are not interested in how stars are forming or how supernova or you know solar flares. So to me, they are never to they are you know like these extreme problems. Why is that? You know, all kids nowadays are interested in this. Okay, uh, so part of the thing is uh, movies which they see, for example, uh, they go to see Interstellar. You know, that is the topic for of those movies. Uh, but that is again a small urban class. Even if you go to YouTube and watch, try to watch videos about astronomy, just do a YouTube search, and you will see half the videos or more than half the videos are about. history of universe and about uh, extreme events like black holes you know that is second part and third part is when some students go and ask somebody what are the present really challenging or unsolved problems so then typically most first answer comes out from even science communicators is oh we still don't understand exactly how universe was formed or we still don't understand the physics of black holes completely so again they get the right idea this is i understand agree with you that this is not the most ideal scenario and they should understand that uh, there is a lot of work still to do in many other uh, topics which people think are well understood but are not actually well understood but uh, whatever excites them at this moment is good when they come to astronomy then you, you can introduce to more things and say that okay it is not just this is exciting but this is also another exciting area which you have not heard about yeah uh, ravi first then what should just to add to That is the particular reason for such fascination. So please make the mic the online people. The first of all, I think it's not just confined to this generation. Even the yeah. earlier generations, yeah. even when yeah. they are in the new, the first thing would be black hole and cosmology, and it's still continuing. And one reason for that is the popular books like First Team, they have first first team yet, and also the Big History of Time and Hopkins, and very popular others. They continue to this. 
books written in other areas they change as a little bit of a bomb. Right. Oshu? Okay. I am going to ask a sensitive question if you don't mind, but I have never seen any uh, strong effort to make sure children understand the difference between astronomy and astrology. Uh, and uh, even when I was a PhD student, when I said I have been PhD in astronomy, people have asked me to read their hand or arm, tell me something. Yeah, so. I think, I don't know if it's a sensitive issue that the, at the government level it's sensitive, but there should be an effort to make sure children understand astronomy is science-based, whereas astrology is something else. I will go a step further and say that first we have to make this, make teachers understand this. What? what? Make teachers understand different between astronomy and astrology. Yes, yes, of course. Because actually, I, I had done some interviews with teachers uh, four years back where we try to understand how deep-seated is their belief in astrology. And the way we did was we had a group of teachers sitting together. We had a group discussion with them. And some of the teachers were favoring astrology. And they were saying, okay, there is a scientific reason behind astrology. We tried to prompt them with some uh, or things like, see, okay, you say that the planets affect uh, people, uh, Okay, do you, you do gravitational force in, at school? Uh, they, they were all physicists, mind, mind you. Uh, so, you know, can you calculate the force because of sun, sorry, Jupiter on, on this on you? And suppose your friend is sitting next to you. Can you calculate the force because of Jupiter on, on that person? Will there be a difference? You know, we gave them these prompts and tried to see if they would change their ideas. But some of the teachers are still resistant to change their ideas. So, the you know, teaching students is Next step, but first we have to educate our teaching community that, that they should not believe astrology and they should not promote astrology in, in the, while teaching. Uh, one way uh, is it, like if you introduce children more to the night sky, uh, would that help? Uh, I think you will have to explicitly address the astrology question. Implicitly, it can't be done because even if you just say, see the night sky, this, that, they don't carry the take home the message that okay everything uh, is very far and it will not really have effect on you. That message doesn't reach them. You have to explicitly keep addressing that. Okay, tough problem. Thank you. Oh uh, yeah, so true. Yeah. It's changing the mindset of teacher and student, but what about the parents? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. So, okay. Uh, I said teachers because unless we change teachers' mindset, students' mindset cannot change. But I am skeptical about changing mindset of any adult person. Usually, they just cling to whatever they have already believed. So students is where you can still easily make a, uh, make them realize that uh, that this is something different. And if students decide at the age like early teenagers, if the students realize that there is no uh, uh, the astrology is all uh, uh, wrong and uh, there is no uh, physical meaning to it, then they would not listen to their parents. Yeah, well, I was just, uh, in general that astrology. We see that all these models work on the star ecology. So, that observation is for the young The parents will be able to use the word obstacle. So, how do you generate this? See, uh, what happens is you realize that outside some metros, the safety issues which parents feel are actually real. So, we I would not say that parents are unduly concerned about safety of the kids going out somewhere outside the village in an open field at night. So, uh, I understand parents' point of view. That is about the night sky programs and things like that. Now, when it comes to choosing astronomy as career, again, the difference between India and Western countries, 
is in, in India, you still have a large school population where who are just coming out of uh, the resource uh, poor status. In a sense, uh, their parents, when they grew up, they never had any resources. Uh, they just took up some jobs, small jobs, and they're now trying to educate their kids. First generation. Not necessarily first generation, but effectively first generation. Like, there are many first generation learners still as well. But like, people who just, uh, parents who managed to just finish schooling or somehow did some graduation and got some small job, and they're now trying to educate their kids. For them, they don't see astronomy as safe career. So, or any science research. For them, safe career is something which will pay. You see, 80-90% of the people who come for astronomy PhDs or even science PhDs, they would be people whose parents are some way in, in that. In a sense, in the sense that they think, okay, it is okay for my kid to take a chance. They don't force kids to, they, they no, you have to start earning immediately as soon as you graduate. So that problem is related to the overall economic status of our population. We can't simply address it as uh, just a perception problem. Uh, let's take two questions from online and then come back to you. Uh, in the meantime, I request people on Zoom to type in their questions or raise their hand and all of them. Uh, there's a question on, on YouTube from Pavik Dasgupta. Can baseline study of state of astronomy education be carried out by other institutions and submitted to the OAE India Centre? Has yes. the questionnaires or surveys already been developed? Uh, he's, he's from the uh, uh, Centre. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Uh, thanks for the question, Avik. Uh, yes, definitely. We, uh, obviously, OE, as I said, like four or five people. We cannot go all around the country and do this. So, uh, Baseline study is something which we want, we are starting to develop. The questionnaire or the protocol of interviews is not ready yet, but we, it will be ready in next couple of months. So we are hoping that in the second semester of this academic year, we, uh, we can start doing this in different places. And we would like definitely uh, people like you to help us. Yeah. One more question from, uh, from YouTube, from Sohan Acharya. Uh, as a citizen scientist, he thinks citizen science projects participation by school students can play a significant role. Do you want to comment on that and how that relates to the India Centre plans? Yeah, so citizen science projects are definitely important. Uh, there are some projects like Galaxy Zoo is a very good example internationally where they started just as like citizen, the, they were expecting amateurs or other student participants to just do some manual classification. But the community of discussion and through, through that, the uh, people did learn a lot of new things. People uh, came up with their own discoveries of Galaxy Zoo, and all these things happened. Uh, so it can be done if it done rightly. Uh, it can give very good results. Uh, but at the same time, there are also other citizen science programs which mainly focus on uh, just uh, very manual kind of work. Uh, which doesn't really give you insight in the astronomy behind it. So just do, mechanically do, take this image, do this, take the, uh, just follow these steps. You will get some nice thing on the uh, on the uh, screen at the end. That is the end of it. That kind of citizen science projects may not be the best thing to happen for students. They may get excited, yes, definitely. They, they I don't deny the power and uh, the. Uh, imagination getting flared up by, by the uh, by this, but as a what is learning gain for the students? I have some doubts about some of these uh, citizen science projects. But uh, the other groups which are doing citizen science projects, that's why I did, we did not focus on the, that part. Uh, internationally, there are groups, but also like uh, groups like Pune Knowledge Cluster is uh, coming up with new citizen science projects. Uh, so Sudarshan is here actually. So um, then there are people doing it. Like, we will support them if they ask for support. There is one more YouTube question before my battery dies. Uh, so, so uh, Anurag Singh, uh, can we students of National Institute advisors help in some way in developing astronomy education? If yes, how can we help? Uh, definitely, we can uh, collaborate with the astronomy clubs uh, in uh, ISAs and IITs. Uh, and uh, as Avik was asking, uh, be it about baseline studies or once we develop the uh, competency surveys, or uh, 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 creating concept maps. Any of these projects, we can uh, collaborate with the astronomy clubs in different institutes. Uh, yeah. So, uh, 
Is it possible to tie up with some local newspaper of the gay states? Because uh, if they write at least one page for astronomy, then nowadays everybody takes this uh, newspaper thing and if we, if we can like retire with the most popular newspaper and they write, I do not see anything science related in the newspaper. So, uh, because uh, when I was a student, I was kind of student, I saw a very coming school of uh, one page, which is called Know How. And they used to write this type of astronomy and all these things like all. It is possible. There are many newspapers who would take up this, but it is a big commitment. Uh, in Mumbai, for example, uh, Marathi Vijayan Parishadha Group, which has this tie up with one of the leading Marathi newspapers called Luxatta, for last eight years, every day there is a 200 word column, 200 to 20 words column about something related to astronomy. Each year they take different things. One year the theme was astronomy, one year the theme was uh, minerals, one year the theme was climate change. So uh, one year the theme was mathematics and so on. So every day there is a 200 word column, but to get people to write that, each day you have to give this content and write it in a way in which normal uh, non-science people would understand. That's a big commitment. Somebody has to dedicatedly put effort. So it is a question of availability of people and time. It is not a question of whether newspapers are ready. Newspapers are ready. Oh, yeah, other questions, comments? Yes, that's true. Oh, mind. Citizen science project, where you go, how is your Again, it depends on what purpose they are serving. So, like, if there, if there is a concrete learning gain at the end of the project, I would put them in under education. If it is just, uh, just mechanically do few things for three, one three hour session, at the end they just go away, it is, I'll put them under outfits. Uh, other questions, come please. So my question uh, regarding this, thank you for the nice talk. So my question regarding this outreach and education. You said that outreach are one time interaction also. And so how will you implement this education in the school level also? Like how many interactions will be for one month or four? So now the refer yes, the my nice part about outreach is that since you are Going to different group each time, you can cover large number of students or large number of uh, large fraction of community where, by doing outreach events. Uh, but education, if you want to sustain interaction, you can only do with smaller groups. So obviously, you don't expect that because of your educational activities, the whole system is going to change. What you are doing is providing a model that this can be done or change can be affected this way, and then. Other groups can do it with other, other students or looking at it model, policy can bring, a, bring in that change. So together, uh, system, then that will be the change system will change. You don't expect that you will change perception of astronomy of all students in, in Bangalore. You will work with only one class, maybe 50 students. One more question that you said like more than 85% of the college teachers are from uh, school, school teachers. School teachers. Yes, school teachers who are teaching physics are from math background. So, can you learn are these primary books and government books or private for school teachers? No, no. See, uh, I said at school level, high school level, class 9 to 12. Uh, so, in Karnataka, for example, there is a PU system where 11, 12, there is subject wise teachers physics, chemistry, biology, math, there are different teachers. But in many states, there is no PU system. The 9 to 12 is together. High school, even Kendri Vidyalaya has followed the same model, JND has followed the same model. 9 to 12, there is, or it is called high school. So there are science teachers and there are math teachers. Now, what we see among those, those who are employed as science teachers, most of them are chemistry and biology background. And they don't feel conf confident enough to teach uh, physics topics. So they would requ request their uh, colleagues who are math teachers. But can you teach these physics topics as well? That is what is happening in schools right now. If you go the this recruitment process, like they are not hiring the deep background from the physics. There is only science teacher kind of post. There is no physics teacher post. So pe people apply, and then sorry, some of the the best people among those who apply are hired. 
maybe there i don't know why there is so much dominance maybe more biology people are going in teaching or whether uh, the good physics people are getting other jobs i don't know exactly what is happening but the fact is that in the teacher population there is over dominance of biology teachers i think that is true in most states in india hmm. uh, any other question kamish we'll have one more question of this yeah so maybe the <coughs> it's also a very sensitive question like most so actually i in my experience what i find we did not many of my friends went to many schools to get it astrology actually and popularize astronomy the problem what i found is many yeah, students are phd like us who have done formal phd in astronomy they don't even know how to falsify astrology so in that what is your take so do you think that most of the astrophysicists are able to in our country are able to falsify with proper rational logic because the students will ask how the question what do you know about astrology why i have to listen to your argument for example something like this that's a important question okay. yeah. We recently we had in within ASL to collect the statistics of textbook for uh, the like astronomy role in And we, I also I forgot I think I'm not the state board of the ASL, but uh, the result was like the astronomy portion was very good. They have added up to the optics and uh, some of the classical mechanics in the calculation, but there is no. So uh, the answer to all these things is if, if we are starting. So within the curriculum itself, the school level, of course, this can be uh, started. Earlier it was that recently they removed the portion. That may be one of the issues. Okay, I will take the two things separately. So first, uh, to answer Vagish, uh, see the issue, are you are you're rightly uh, saying that uh, many of our professional astronomers, they don't feel that they know enough about it to argue it, uh, argue it out uh, Correctly. Uh, so, yes, we can do something about that. What we should always do is try to understand what are the main arguments on which the astrology uh, proponents uh, build their, uh, build their uh, whole structure. So, what they say, what will be the main contributing factors to your uh, effect of planets, uh, effect of planets, and so on. So, these are very minimal and these are coming from layman person. But if you go to even many university professors are now teaching astrology because it has been introduced by UTC. So if you want to argue with that intellectuals who have some arguments but maybe not right, I think astronomers also need very good education to argue. Yeah, we we also need to understand what they what they're teaching before we so that we can defeat them at their own argument. That's one thing. Uh, this is uh emphasis on astrology did not start now uh, 20 years back it started that time astronomers really opposed it. That, that's why we made it optional for universities to include astrology. But there have been universities which have been teaching astrology for the last 20 years. Even in science. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, coming to what uh, this uh, Crispin was saying, uh, see, thing, there are two or three factors. Well, one factor is that uh, fighting with policymakers to include uh, that astrology is not a science. And astrology, can, uh, debunking astrology in the textbook uh, is one matter. But just by including it in textbook, it is not clear that it will be actually taught in the class. So for that, you have to again educate teachers. That is the second matter. And third thing you should remember that nowadays, generally, you see this more prominently in Western countries, but also you start seeing in urban India now that there is general. Disbelief for things which are there in textbook or in some books of authority because people go to YouTube and read, uh, listen to something different. Oh, many YouTube they have, but textbook is wrong. That is the kind of attitude which you see, start seeing nowadays. So it is not enough to just say, okay, okay textbook may dal diya, it will not happen that way. Very last question. Uh, I have another comment uh, so I think you are right in saying that you know it's not an easy thing to do this. But then also one more stakeholders we have talked about is so me, Aniket, and also Ravi come from also come from a popular science movement background. Right? And if you look at who are the people who have been opposing pseudoscience or astrology in India over the last 30, 40 years, it's not been the scientists, scientists are not the people who have been doing most, most of it has been done by the people science movement, right? Various things. 
like for PGDS, or PMS, or whatever, right? And, and, and in some states, these people and movements do have connections with astronomers. Some states, they may look scientists refuse to go and work with us. So that's also something, I guess, to, to think about. The last thing I want to say that uh, no, we have, of course, in IA itself, we have scope. And uh, if you have any ideas about which follow from this talk, please come and talk to me. Of course, we'll, we will try and put together some programs uh, in IA which, which kind of align with what we're saying. Uh, and that's something we we'll look forward to. So thanks. So uh, there are a couple of questions on YouTube which are related to astronomy in general. I would, I would suggest that they write to outreach at iap.res.in. Uh, these are general astronomy questions, so we'll handle it from there. Uh, so thanks for people attending on YouTube and Zoom. Thanks for everybody who's come here. And most of all, thanks for Nikit Soleil for being here from Bombay for giving this amazing talk about something new uh, and exciting in a field which has not received much institutional attention so far. With a thanks again. Thanks.